Cool. Thanks, everyone, then, for joining again to the Data Science Incubator. Today, uh, I would like to talk about this problem of in the interdependent pull requests. And with this, I'm, I promise this is the last time I talk about uh, PR hell, you know, the pull requests hell. So next week, we'll be talking about something different, which is a relief probably for, for most of us. So what do I mean by interdependent pull requests? Well, imagine this situation. So uh, let's say that um, I'm a contributor and I create a pull request, say pull request number one, and I start working with it. I submit that pull request to the source repository, which I first forked, uh, and, and that's fine, right? So this, the pull request is still sitting there, but then I'm, I'm in a rush, so I start the second pull request, uh, and because it depends on pull request number one, then I branch off PR2 from the tip of PR1. So basically I'm expecting as a contributor that PR1 is going to be kind of accepted as is. Um, just assume that so I can move on and start working on pull request two. But then, you know, real life is not as good as it looks like and then the maintainers of um, the source repository do merge pull request one, but with some changes. By the time the contributor continues to work on pull request two, then the pull request is not perfectly in sync. So it may be that there is not a git conflict sensu stricto, but still there are some changes that need to be done on pull request two to adapt to the changes introduced by the maintainer when that person merged the pull request. So this is like, I know it's a mouthful, but I'm going to kind of explain this with uh, examples. So that is the topic of today. So basically the take home message is going to be to try avoid this situation as much as you can. And if you don't, then this demo will show you what are you kind of getting into. So uh, again, I will be showing uh, the pull requests helpers from the use this package. So I am assuming that um, we first attach the package with the call library use this. And then I'm also assuming that we already start with a local clone of our fork from a source repository. So there is you know, at least two ways in which you could do that. You, know, you can go to the source repository, then you know, click fork so that you, you know, create a fork on your own account. And there you can click on the green button clone or download. You get the URL, pass it to uh, our studio and you create a local clone. But the, the way I like actually is, is much easier. I use the um, function from the use this package called create from GitHub. And that function takes an argument that you just say, well, what's the owner organization, what's the repo, and the, the whole thing just happens magically. So all of that was done kind of, let's assume, before you see this slide. So now in this slide, assuming that then you attach the package, you created a local clone of, of the source repo, and you're good to go. So now I'm going to represent the uh, perspective of a contributor, and I want to initiate this pull request, which I call PR1. So I run the function PR init, PR1, and with this, what I do is I create a branch of the master branch, which is synchronized with the upstream repo, with the source repo, because I did this very quickly. So I'm assuming that you know it's all good to go. So let's say that as, as a contributor, uh, I, I want to do this change. So what I want to do is to add a new file called f.r, which we can see here. And I add a function called f, which is very simple. Uh, I'm, I don't care about you know, what I actually do, just to show you a very kind of small and tiny example. So I save the file, I create a commit, and what you're seeing on screen is what the, um, Git history could look like. Uh, so this is the commit that I would introduce as a contributor. That's why, uh, just to make things more explicit, I type in the message the letter capital C. Of course, you wouldn't do that, but just to kind of show very explicitly that the contributor is adding this new f, new function f in the file f.r. So for now, life is good. We continue, you know, we save the file, we create a commit, and then we can run the function PR push, which we already saw in other presentations. And we are kind of uh, 
uh, driven to this uh, interface that you can see here at the lower part of the screen, where we can kind of confirm that the commit that we created in this branch called PR1 in the repository ABC, for example, under the owner Mauro Lepore, wants to be submitted to the master branch, wants to be merged into the master branch in the repo ABC of the owner and or. Everything looks green, that's a good sign, so I will be kind of ready as a contributor to click here, create pull request to actually submit this pull request for the maintainers to review it. We're still good to go, so now we are now locally back again in our computer as a contributor, we are in a rush, we want to kind of build on top of PR1 and create a PR2 that depends on PR1. So it's not a very good idea, it's something we want to avoid, but sometimes it does happen, so uh, use this knows that this is not a, uh, the best case scenario. So when you create PR init 2, so when you do PR init PR 2, and if you are standing on PR 1, then use this will, will know that you're not standing on the master branch. I will tell you, create, PR, create local PR branch with non-master parents. What it's telling you is that it is expecting as a, uh, like that usually you would branch off master branch, but now we are branching off PR1. Hmm, okay. Of course, you would try to avoid this, but if you can't, then well, okay, I would say here, yes, absolutely, I'm sure what, you know, what I'm getting into. So I, I you know, type two and we're good to go. So still life is happy. Uh, I kind of retrieved the file that I added in, um, in the PR1, which was, remember that file called f.r, it's still this function here, f, which I added in PR1. But now in PR2, I want to extend that file and add function g, which depends on f. So it's a simple call to f on x. So that's why you know, this PR2 depends on PR1, because I need the function f that was introduced in PR1. OK, we save the file, we create a commit, and, uh, and one, we, once we do that, we are ready to kind of push that PR2 to GitHub, which we can do with PR push. Again, we are kind of, we land on this interface this time, you know, to confirm that the commit that we added on PR2 in the repo ABC of the owner Mauro Lepore wants to be kind of merged into the master branch of the repo ABC of the owner and or. And boom, I click create pull request. So for now, everything looks green because the maintainers haven't touched uh, PR1 or PR2. So the maintainers haven't still reviewed any of the two PRs that I have just submitted. But now the maintainers do that. The maintainers uh, go to their local uh, clone of the source repo. Uh, they run the, li the function uh, library. So library use this, they call library use this, and then they fetch PR1. So, I, the, the function PR fetch you might remember from previous um, data science incubators needs the the number of uh, pull requests on GitHub. So this this name will not probably match the name that you gave to your uh, pull request. So the pull request we called it PR one, but it corresponds on GitHub to the number five. That's why PR fetch does the, that's what we want. So that's good, okay, the maintainers do that, and then they kind of review the work of PR1. So the work of PR1 is kind of now shown in red, um, was, uh, you know, that work that we did on, that the that contributors did on file f.r. But the maintainers decide to rename that file from f to my underscore f, because they want to rename the function from f to my underscore f. So then, you know, to kind of match uh, to have matching names between the file and the function, they, they decided that that's a good idea. So the green state here is what the final um, contribution will be. That's you know, the, what the maintainers decide it will be. So, okay, they save the file, they create this commit. So the commit is, uh, is here now kind of labeled as with an M for the maintainer. The commit message could be something like rename to my F. So good to go, the maintainers also can run the function PR push to send that commit um, to the pull request, to pull request one, with the edited um, changes. And then they can also go uh, and, uh, and, and merge the pull request. So, you know, if that's all the changes that they want to do on that PR1, they can go on and, um, and merge the pull request. And they have the freedom as well to squash the commits. 
So, you know, if the contributor did one commit, the maintainer did another commit, uh, the history becomes a little messy. So for uh, the upstream repo, for the source repo, it is a good idea to kind of clean things up a little bit. So you do what's called a merge, uh, a squash merge. Basically, you collapse all the commits associated to that pull request into a single commit. And at the same time, you can kind of polish the commit message. You can say something like, well, new my F. Uh, this you know, hash five will become a keyword. That means it comes from, or it relates to the pull request number five on GitHub. You could set, thank the contributor just by you know, showing their um, GitHub uh, username. Uh, you can also sign off if you want as a, a maintainer with your first name, last name, and email. This is a formal Git thing. Um, so this is what the clean history could look like on GitHub after the maintainer uh, merged PR1. But still remember that the contributors have a, this PR2 still in their computer. So now I'm showing you, again, the perspective of the contributor who is standing on PR2, on branch PR2, uh, and uh, because they got an email saying that PR1 had been merged, then they go to their local instance of our studio, so to their clone of their fork. And uh, what they do, they run the, the function PR sync, which we saw in the last edition of the Data Science Incubator. And that synchronizes all the commits that are um, in, uh, in the upstream repo are incorporated into this PR2. And now, Let's kind of stop for a moment and reflect what's going on. So the function PRSync did not throw any error message. It did not detect any Git conflict census stricto, but the PR is now not ideal. There is some duplication. Let me show you what that is. This file f.r exists because PR2 locally still has access to the commit that was introduced on uh, PR1 and was then extended on, on PR2, where we work on file f.r. But then it also brings this file my f.r that was included into the history of this repository by the maintainer, and it was introduced into the um, source repository. So now we are in this uh, situation with a very subtle kind of conflict, a conflict that Git automatically does not detect, but we as humans, just by looking at the history of this pull request, we do detect. So basically there is duplication. This, uh, there is this F function living in the F file and then a an, an modified version of F in the my F file. So this kind of uh, pseudo um, conflict is not very easy to pick. And, uh, and what I'm showing is the kind of simplest example I could think of. So in, a, in real life, you would end up with a potentially a very difficult um, problem to really clean up. So let me show you how you know, we would fix this particular scenario. So, um, well, if I'm the contributor, what I would do, you know, I, once I detect the problem, I could uh, you know, do this commit here where I, I move the function G that dependent that was dependent on f, I would move it first from the file f to the file my f.r. Then in a second commit, I would edit the function g so that the body does no longer call the function f, but calls the function my f, which is the function edited by the maintainer. And then in a third commit, I would probably remove the file f.r completely because we no longer need it. So you can see here that the entire history of um, this Git repo is pretty messy, right? Um, but we can see you know, the different decisions that we've made, all the detailed commits um, on our uh, PR1 and PR2 uh, branches. So once we fix those, uh, that pseudo conflict I was telling you about, then we are ready to do PR push and send that commit once again back to GitHub. Let's assume that the maintainers are happy with that change um, and they merge that pull request. That what they can do is again, do a squash merge so that the, uh, the, the history of those um, three commits that were submitted with pull request two all are 
or can be squashed into a single commit so that the history becomes cleaner. So they would do something like this, new function G associated to the pull request number six. Uh, you mentioned the contributor. Uh, you say that it also relates to pull request five. You think and you sign. So, okay, so let's see what, uh, what's the next step. The next step would be to run the function PR finish. If now, you know, pull request one and pull request two are merged, then there's nothing else we want to do with those branches. Locally, both the contributor and the maintainer can run the function PR finish, and that will switch back to the master branch. It will also pull the changes from the GitHub source repo, uh, and, and then finally remove the PR2 branch. Um, so here in the history of commits, we can see that the end product, after the maintainers have squashed, merged, the git history is, is, is clean, and there is only one commit per pull request. So this commit here, this the one in the middle, refers to the, or is the one where we incorporated the work from PR1, and this one here at the top is the commit associated to PR2. Each of those is a squash merge from the many commits that each PR contained. Um, so, and that's it. So that's the um, end of this presentation where we talked about the problem of inter interdependent pull requests. I showed that even with a, a small example, it can be tricky to pick up what problems there are. Not always the conflicts are ex like uh, Git conflicts sensu stricto that Git could pick up automatically. So uh, if you can take, take home message, avoid this situation. If you cannot, then at least now you know what, what kind of uh, um, yeah, what kind of uh, problems you are going to face. With that, I thank you very much, and I um, I look forward to hearing your questions. A question. <clears throat> um, thanks, Mauro, for your presentation. Um, Constanze, by the way, um, how do you actually detect a problem like that if it doesn't throw an error? I mean, here you 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 see saw it as a maintainer yourself that. Um, F is no longer there, but that um, G must be in my F. But how would you know that if it's not really like from a technical perspective on an error? Yeah, excellent question. It's not easy. Uh, what you have to do is to look at the history of uh, the repo. Uh, as you, you know, for example, the, the, the screen right now shows that if you, if you pull the history of your repo in whatever software you use, you, know, you can see it say, on GitHub itself, or locally on our studio, or you know, or whatever third-party software you use to explore your Git um, or to interact with Git. Uh, usually, you know, each commit um, can be shown so that you see the diff. The diff is this uh, thing that you see in under uh, the screen, where you see you know what has been added by that commit. So it, it is a painful work of exploring file by file or, 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 yeah, file by file in the diff of each commit and try to understand what was the intention. Uh, and that's why it's also very useful to write uh, um, many small commits in the PR. Then if, you know, if we squash them into the um, source repo, that's, that's fine, just to print the history. But, but the PR should have many very small commits with a, a message that explains the intent so that anyone who reviews the pull request can, by reading the message, understand the intent, and then by seeing, exploring the files visually, understand what actually happened. I'm sorry that is a very unsatisfying answer, but that is precisely the challenge, is that it's not obvious uh, what kind of problems you might have. Can you see it graphically from the membership somehow that you've shown? earlier because there was this branch that was going off yeah uh, you mean something like this one or two slides before I think yeah because I think before the, the before you merge again you might be um, yeah somewhere with the dark violet dot right <coughs> So uh, let's see, I keep moving. <coughs> it is, are we looking for a slide to illustrate your point? Um, it was already there. Um, ah, okay. You mean this one or the one after? Um, this one, right? This one. Yeah, 
back. Yeah, yeah this one. <laughs> um, wouldn't you see that somehow that you're on this wrong track in a way, or wouldn't you? I mean, you would see then that off the branch, something is branched off again, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, all you can see here is that. Uh, <coughs> so let me let me kind of. Uh, break down what we're seeing here. So this first commit was a commit done before PR1 mm. was branched. So uh, this second commit belongs to PR1, uh, where the contributor added the new F, then uh, PR1 stopped there, but then the branch continued towards PR2. So in, on PR2 already we added new G, and then along this line, uh, you know, we merged basically the the, this commit here is by the uh, maintainer actually, um, right. on their. Um, so this you know comes from the source repo from the upstream master, and this commit here is the merge between these two commits, and uh, you know the decision, the edit made by the maintainer. So mm -hmm. all you can see is that uh, it's kind of the intent by reading the messages, and if you clicked, so I'm not here on an interactive. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you click on each commit, you could see <laughs> what files changed. But again, be mindful that if one commit contains 50 files and you know 2,000 lines, it's going to be really hard to pick what's going on in each commit. Um, so yeah, I'd really encourage you to break things down as small as possible so that the commit message really explains what's going on. It's, it is a tool for um, to open discussion in uh, with the contributors and maintainers. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mauro, I also have one question. So, let's say the uh, maintainer, they make the changes and then after it could be very difficult for the contributors. So maybe like, uh, for example, at the least uh, practices, what would you suggest? Like, uh, let's say the contributor has uh, opened the pull request, maintainer <coughs> review it. If the maintainer feels that like, yeah, even if there is a 1% uh, he is not happy with uh, something, you can simply reject the pull request and the contributor can make a new pull request with the requested changes. In that case, both the maintainer and contributor, they both would be on the same page. Otherwise, in the, this case, the contributor has like a lot more work to uh, do to make the changes. Instead of that, it would be pretty much simple if the maintainer can simply uh, reject the pull request, request the changes to the contributor, and the contributor opens the new pull request with the changes which are requested. Very, okay. yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly right. Yeah, thanks for the comment. Absolutely. So the, the scenarios are more than two. So I kind of, in a very simplified uh, way, I said, uh, well, the, con the maintainer will either accept or reject your pull request. But it's true what Pranav is, thank, thanks Pranav is highlighting that there is an intermediate scenario where the maintainer say, hey, you know, the pull request is, is, is nice, I really would like to include this, but before it is compliant with whatever you know, we need, um, I please ask you to change this or that. So there is a back and forth. Actually, now I'm, for, I'm, for example, working with Jackson and with Claire in pull requests that take, you know, maybe one or two commits from them, and then uh, one or two commits from me, and then one or two commits from them again. And you go back and forth until whenever you're ready, and then all those commits can be squash merged into a single commit and including the source repo. Yeah. Um, Mara, this is CJ. Uh, uh, just one comment, and I don't really know if this is good advice, but my strategy is always to just, I'm a obsessive about pulling changes from master and then also like if I were working in this style of like uh, doing a PR in a separate branch so you can also rebase your branch on the current master which I would be pretty obsessive about also I, I don't know if that's great advice but that's one way of like kind of avoiding this type of problem altogether because if you're if you're working on some changes and you uh, today and you you do the pull request for the first part, half of your changes, and then you're working on the, the rest of your PR for the rest of the day, but you don't quite finish, so then you, you leave it and you come back tomorrow. I would normally like uh, rebase my <laughs> that branch in the morning when I came in rather than assume that nothing else had changed on master, and that would possibly avoid some kind of problem like this. I don't know how you yeah. have a comment about that. 
Great. Yeah, I, I, I do. Um, I would like to just, I mean, I, I totally do rebases my, myself as well. For those who are not familiar with what that is, it's a special flavor of merging <laughs> that uh, it is special in that it rewrites the history of a branch or a repo uh, by basically imagine that you have, you know, a branch on a tree, you cut the branch from you know the connection between the trunk and the branch and then you move the branch at the top of another branch so that's kind of the concept of rebasing or you also can think of it as rebasing a car so one branch is at one state and then you come from behind and you rebase that uh, branch and then you can kind of go uh, on top the issue with that is only when you actually um work uh, with someone on the same repo so i, I you know absolutely do rebases all the time when I'm working on my own um, before I submit a pull request. So, you know, locally I rebase um, all the time just to have a kind of a cleaner Git history. And once you start sharing the, the pull request or a repo, the problem with a rebase or the only thing that one needs to be aware of is that they, they, there's other people sharing the same history of that um, repo. And thus, if you, rever if you rebase, you're changing that history and that might um, cause a problem in the other people. Once you know, they want to push their history won't match the history that you pushed uh, after you rebase. So absolutely use it, absolutely be mindful once you are uh, working with someone else uh, that you might make their lives very difficult. So the advice that I've read everywhere is use rebase uh, all the way until you share your work. And then when you share, you're kind of, um, I mean, you can still do some, um, for example, when, when, when the whole pull request is squashed, that commit rebases the upstream master, right? So there is, it is happening in a rebase, but not in a repo that the other people is, is sharing. Might be a little confusing for those that are not uh, very familiar with Git, but uh, you know, we can probably continue the discussion elsewhere. I think we're out of questions in Berlin. <laughs> cool, great. Anyone else? No, okay, cool. Thank you very much for your patience. Sorry. Oh, I, I did have a question. It just took me a second to find the unmute button. Sorry, guys. I don't know if anyone's, everyone's still there or not. Go ahead, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sit here. Um, yeah, so for uh, the suggested solution to this, uh, would it be to try to um, to try to contribute to the to the original pull request continually until you're happy with that that piece of work in in, in most scenarios? Or yeah, I guess I guess would that be uh, the system that makes most sense? Or just or just to wait? Yeah. Um... So you're saying that what what happens if you do need to uh, create a pull request to um, what you do if you wait until PR one is merged before you even start? Is that your question? Well, I, I guess that that you uh, that could be one solution. But could you not also just con keep contributing to pull request one any of the changes you would have wanted to add to pull request two? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a. Uh, yeah, that's true. Because um, in that sense, you can I can work like you know. Let's say you've made a change to pull request one. I can work collaborati collaboratively with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess maybe that that might make the pull request a bit of a nightmare. That's true. Actually, that's a good, very good point, Jackson. I think that uh, I mean, the only problem might be that you know the pull request. If the pull request is kind of very focused towards one specific topic, um, yeah, that makes then sense. Then it kind of it gets a little. Um, it gets blurry. What's the intent of that pull request? But it's very true that you can continue to add commits, as many commits as you want to a pull request. So maybe from the perspective of avoiding conflict, that would be a, a good thing to do. So I agree. Uh, maybe, you know, it's, it's a conversation that we should have between maintainers and contributors to say, hey, look, my intent was this, but now I extend um, my intent to that. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, you know, maybe the maintainers can work on, on, the, on the commits that are, you know, the first three commits and kind of for the moment disregard the others, but still trying to maintain the, the last commits, uh, you know, in sync with the, the first ones. I think it could be a thing that I would be interested in trying, Jackson. All right, I'll give it a shot. That's, that's my only question. <laughs> Good. Okay, then thank you very much. Thanks, Mario. Thank you, Mario. Thanks, Mario. Ciao. Thanks, Mario. Ciao.